Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative media. media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. Fine, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, glad you're back on the Investigative Journal on this Tuesday. As always, I'm glad you're back. Yesterday we talked a lot about following the Vatican Trail of Money. Uh, I call them the richest organization in the world. And boy, it's uh, easy to back that up when you look about all these concordats that they have with countries around the world. This is a very, very murky legal area that I want to get into today because it really exemplifies who they are, and when I say they're the most duplicitous organization in the world, I mean that. It's incredible when you start really looking at who they are. Now, I want to preface what I'm saying today regarding concordates, uh, agreements, treaties with Vatican and over 200 countries in the world. Uh, But I said yesterday, I came down pretty hard yesterday on truth movements, and I got an email saying, Greg, you know, people are just trying to get to the truth and you know, why are you saying that it's not worth it for them to get involved in chemtrails, into 9-11, etc., etc.? And I said, well, listen, yesterday's show was geared at waking people up. Uh, I'm not going to tell a person not to get involved with his favorite uh, truth movement or something that he feels dear in his heart to do, like maybe to help uh, stray animals, things like that, or to uh, work with the environment uh, to do many different things, uh, working to stop chemtrails. But yesterday's show was geared at waking people up and saying, listen, if you do this, you got to go a step farther because you have to say to yourself, look back in history and see exactly where these movements have taken us. Sure, a lot more people know there's chemtrails, but chemtrails is exploding all over the skies. It hasn't stopped. I was reading an article today about chemtrails, just a new one. It came out and said, oh, um, a army general admits there's chemtrails. Yeah, big deal. Are they going to stop them? Hell no. And do you really realize how bad they are? Sure we do. We know they're putting barium and all these toxic metals into the environment which can have a devastating effect on the health of the earth as well as its people, as well as uh, supercharging perhaps uh, weaponized weather. So we know it exists, but is it ending? It's getting worse, and that was my point. And my point of yesterday's show was to, to just to let people know that you really have to get to the root cause before anything could ever change. And unfortunately... Uh, we don't. And this is a worldwide problem. I mean, this is uh, s- something that is not just centered in America. Although America being the Vatican-led New World Order's big prize, and they're working hard to bring it to its, bring us to its knees and create this kind of global environment that they want. Easier to control us, right? Your owners can control you quite easily if everybody is under the same laws, under the same... Uh, Basically, you get the same information worldwide, right? Very easy to control instead of having, you know, it's difficult to control even 50 states. If every, if Why do you think the states in the United States don't have the power they used to? Because they're centralizing all authority. So, anyway, that's what yesterday's show was geared to do. Now, today I want to take a, the, the normal approach that I take, and basically it's this. Sometimes when you get, do shows like this, you're reaching an audience that is at different uh, spectrum of the truth scale, I call it. For example, I use a 1 to 10 scale, 1 meaning you're just beginning to break away from believing everything the government and the Vatican and all the religions tell you, all the way to 10, where you don't believe a word they say. And so I realize I talk to a lot of people in that truth scale at different Uh, levels, so to speak. And I understand that if I say something regarding, if I say this statement, the Vatican is a satanic organization, that will resonate with people on 8 or 9 or 10 on the true scale, but will not resonate with people 1, 2, 3 to 5. 
it'll maybe just go, boy, this guy's crazy. That's impossible. So you really, I understand, whatever level you're at, uh, I'm trying to make it easy for you. And so by doing stories like this, factual stories about finances, about how they operate in the in the world climate with different governments of the world, I think it is basically something that anybody from 1 to 10 on that true scale can listen to. And the only thing I have to do is to emphasize that it's important to listen. It's kind of like going into a class and, you know, the instructor saying, listen, okay, you're here for a reason. And today, folks, the reason you're here is to learn about concordance, human rights, separation of church and state, things like the tricks of how they get these agreements together without people knowing about them, even though they're supposed to, uh, how to stop concordance, what the, the different countries, how many are there? 200. Uh, and how religion, this religious threat, is really a threat on human rights. And I think if you take it from that approach, and we'll forget about all of the emotional stuff, I think you'll understand when I make the statement that the Vatican-led New World Order has one goal, and that is total control under the Pope, using all of the minions in government as his secular pawns. So, with that, let's try to show you how they operate in the world. Now, the word concordant may be strange to you, but it's really just a legal agreement. Think of this. It's you getting together with uh, somebody else. In this case, it's two countries. This is why the Vatican, for example, became a, uh, has state recognition, a country recognition in the United Nations when it's as big as a football field. And this is weird. And the way they got it is very interesting. We'll get to that in another show. Because it is totally, totally uh, amazing how they became a state, a country. Not only a country, but a religion as well. I mean, it's incredible. It's, it's very unique. And if you ever are in Rome... Just, you have to check out behind those Vatican walls. It's, I used to walk through them all the time for years, having a job of covering certain things at the Vatican. And it's just amazing to me. Uh, I always wondered, well, how can this be a country? There's like 400 people. They have their own post office, their own everything. You know, police force, they have their own courts, everything. And it's right in the heart of Italy. How did that ever happen? Well, that would take a couple of shows to explain. But we're, t we're centering on how they operate under the radar, but yet gain total control of countries. We, they, they're in 200 different countries or more. And it's really just a legal agreement between the country and the Vatican, which is not, don't think of it as a religion today. Think of it as a sovereign state, a country in itself. And how the Pope became this secular power, <laughs> do you ever realize, <laughs> is, is incredible. And we'll get to that in another time. But it can set up a theological fiefdom where certain human rights do not even apply and where they can never again be introduced without the consent of the Catholic Church. So this is interesting. Or we'll just say it's the Vatican State. Okay. Once you get involved with them, I'll, I'll show you how you can't get out. This is why concordates represent a fundamental threat to both any kind of democracy and human rights. Now, they find, uh, the Vatican State finds many, many different uses for its over 200 current legal agreements with countries. Now, for example, in May of 2012, listen to this, this is really interesting and it has something to do with the just think about the pedophile cases that just came to the news recently in America and by the way that's nothing new I mean here it's been treated like wow one-time deal 
Did they forget about what happened in Ireland? Did, have they forgotten on the news here that it goes on all over the world? Yeah, they don't tell you that. And the reaction from the news media shows you how they're in the pocket of the Vatican because one of the broadcasters yesterday said this. He said, how are we going to handle this scandal? And he said, I think we should handle it by looking at our own faiths, if you're not a Catholic, and look at where we also went wrong. Don't just center the blame on the Catholic Church. I mean, what a bunch of garbage. <laughs> and what they're trying to do is make it seem like it's just this kind of thing. It doesn't happen all the time. We get these bad apples in the basket. We'll get rid of them and we'll, we'll restore the good church. That's as far from the truth as you'll ever get. Now, in May 2012, this is... So, remember what the Vatican said yesterday. It said, we are sorry we made mistakes with these children. We're going to correct it. Now, that is just window dressing. That's not what they mean. They have to say that. Because listen what they said in 2012. In May of 2012, the Italian bishops even said that their concordat, their agreement with the Italian state, excuse them from having to report to the police suspected cases of child abuse by fellow priests. So here they are on one hand saying, we made a mistake by allowing this to happen and we need to have the state help. And then the second, on the, on the other side, they're saying, we don't, we don't have to tell you anything because of our agreement with you. Did you hear that? So don't believe a word they say. They are going to continue this action of, uh, you know, this, this kind of degradation of children from now to the, uh, the end of time. It's not going to end. It'll only get worse. Trust me. Now, if you look at some of these concordas, they're, they're usually translated into two languages, the language of the country and then the Italian language, which is the official language of the Vatican. Okay? Now, Let's, this is a little murky, but you gotta realize that this is important here. Because this is how they get away with uh, literally murder. What, these concordates, now, they're international treaties, right? That's what most of them are with the Vatican. Uh, that may range from granting little more than diplomatic recognition, which is at the low scale, to a legally binding commitment to observe key aspects of Vatican doctrine, canon law, and they have taxpayers from countries subsidize the church. Now, because the state may be put under pressure to enforce these policies, uh, you got to read stuff regarding church and state separation. And we'll get to that because in our country, okay, what's the situation here in America? Let's just use America as an example. We're, we have diplomatic relations set up with the Vatican. We don't have a legal treaty, but we don't need one here because they use our Constitution to get everything they want. So we've been doing this since, well, prior to Reagan, we cut off diplomatic relations with them because of the Lincoln assassination ever since the Patriots back then said, hey, no more, you know, you kill our president, you're not, you're not welcome here. Although the priests were welcome. So nothing really changed. It just went under the table a bit. But then, you know, as time passed, and as the politicians said, well, nobody even remembers that. And if you look at anything on the Lincoln assassination in history, in the normal history books, you're never going to get the true story. So they said, well, now it's time to let people know we're bringing the Vatican back, and they're going to have their little office building in Washington, and we got our diplomatic relations. But when you realize the subsidies that we're giving them, it's an amazing story. And plus, when next to our government, they're the largest uh, holder of assets, corporation, and land in our country. So, and I guess you got to put the Chinese in there too. But uh, so you're going to look at this material uh, on church and state that we'll get to because it's important. Because there is supposed to be a separation between the church and the state, right? Well, no, no more. It doesn't exist when you're talking about these Vatican and their concordates. So, uh, in one place, concordates are removed from democratic control forever. Now, let me explain this to you, because yesterday I kind of glossed over it and said, you know, they, get, they do these treaties, people don't even know about them, 
And supposedly with the treaty, you're supposed to have some kind of uh, legislative recognition and approval. But here's how it operates, really. So really, when you say they get into these treaties and nobody knows about it, it's true. But let me tell you how they do it. The, the laws can be changed by parliaments, by uh, United States Congress, by in democratic institutions in other countries like Mexico, etc. But concordance cannot be changed. Okay, let me explain why. That's because they're supposed to be international treaties. Now, they have over 200 of these. That is, agreements between a real country and the Holy See and the Vatican country. Okay? So that's the agreement. Two countries getting together. Now, even in democracies, okay, most democracies, there is only a brief period. This is like even in our country or the more advanced democracies in the world that are in bed with the Vatican. There's supposed to be, you know, time to reflect on this and to have a vote. People are supposed to know. But in effect, what really happens is uh, these votes take place, if they ever do, in a matter of days. This can only, you know, and what does, it does not allow for proper legal scrutiny of any one of these documents. Now, I've went to a couple uh, sites and, and researchers who are meticulous about following every one of these Vatican Concordates. And they say the general rule is that these countries are sneaking these agreements through. Now, you get a few days, you got legislative tricks maybe used to get the Concordate through. And there's a whole bunch of tricks they use to get an agreement with a country so they can get special favors. Now, once these concordates, so we can get, we can talk about, there's a handful, well, 10 to 15 documented sneaky little lawyer tricks they use to bypass the vote of people or scrutiny to get these concordates in it. And most people in any country, I bet you go to Australia, England, Germany, you go to America and you say, do you realize that the Vatican has a treaty with you? No, they'll go, no. They're a religious organization. What do you mean a treaty? Well, yeah, remember yesterday we talked about how much money these countries are actually spending on the Vatican and how they're not even taking care of their poor children? How about the country that built the biggest cathedral in the world? It's the poorest country in the world. They build the biggest cathedral in the world, and these people are starving. But yet they can come in the Vatican and the Vatican can say, we forgive you and you will go to heaven. So don't worry about starving here on earth. Okay? Now, the reason, once the, you get in bed with these people this way, a concordat or a treaty, it's set in stone. It's not going to be, you can't come up the next month and go, I want to change that with a new vote or you get new parliament people in, new legislative people. No. Because a concordat is, it's ratified in stone. That's because treaties cannot be changed unilaterally. Any alteration requires the consent of both parties. That means if I'm a country like uh, Brazil and I say, hey, I don't like paying you guys this anymore. The Vatican says, oh, that's too bad. We got to agree to it. It can't be changed unilaterally. It's got it. So it's set in stone. And in a dictatorship, and a lot of countries aren't even democratic like ours, right? It's worse. It can be rubber stamped by a military junta, by some some uh, dictator, or even go through with no ratification at all. For the signature of the dictator and his foreign minister is enough, and the people, they don't know. Yet when the dictator is toppled, let's say the dictator is toppled, the concordat remains. Now, what they do ensure for the Vatican, and this is why I call them the richest organization in the world, with little or no uh, oversight on how they do business, sometimes the concordats ensure a never-ending transfer of state funds to the church. Now, you might be sitting here going, Greg, you know, this is, remember, this is a, this, this show's geared towards just uh, learning about how they do this. I'm not even getting into whether it's 
uh, illegal or even into their illegal drug trade, into their pedophilia, into trafficking of human beings, slave trade, all of the illegal things they've been involved with over the years. This is, this is just how they get into a country to perhaps shift funds to do things, to get benefits. Sometimes the money transfer is justified. Now, it can be a never-ending transfer. And sometimes in countries it's justified as compensation for church property, nationalized as long as, you know, 200 years ago. Concordance can lock in inflation-adjusted payments that cannot be ended unless the Vatican agrees. Concordance often shift funds to the church by requiring that the Catholic Church, Catholic schools, hospitals, and other agencies must be paid by the state. This gives the church the say over what is taught and what services are offered without having to pay the tab. Pretty good, isn't it? A concordat can also help church agencies get tax exemptions, even for church-run commercial enterprises. And despite all the state money flowing in, the Concordia can ensure that the finances of the church are, guess what, kept secret. Nobody knows about them. And that's in the agreement. So they're getting, you know, they're getting their cake and eat it too. They get everything free when somebody wants to say, hey, where's this money going? Uh-uh. Your politicians won't tell you. They can sometimes, these Concordates, can also infringe on human rights. They give advantages to one religious group over others. Concordates can violate the requirement that all citizens and religions be treated equally. I thought that's what America is all about. But nowhere in the world are you going to find that. Occasionally, Concordates have outlawed divorce, even for non-Catholics. Concordates can also anchor other parts of the canon or church law by stipulating that this is to be used within church institutions. So they're dictating, they're overriding a country's law and putting in their own. Well, what's the difference then? Everybody here in America is worried about, oh, we can't allow Sharia law. Well, not everybody. Half the country says, hey, who cares? Let them have Sharia law. Yeah, you want to have Sharia law? <laughs> Yeah, you won't have any rights. But what's the difference, really, if the Vatican can come here and, and force their canon law on people through an agreement? Then what's the difference than that from Sharia law? It's the same thing, except it's a different faith, right? And they can stipulate it to be used within church institutions or outside of the institutions. But these also include social agencies. Many non-clerics and even non-Catholics may find themselves legally obliged to obey church canon law. And I say, what's the difference between that and what the Muslims want to do with Sharia law? The difference is the Vatican has a great PR campaign. They have a great public relations department. They can BS you with the best of them. And everybody thinks... Oh, they can't do anything wrong because the Pope tells us he's God on earth. He's Christ on earth. He's also king of the earth. They don't really tell you that, but that's what he, you know, you ever hear a Pontifus? He's called Pontifus Maximus. Get the translation on that. So he's not only wants to be the God on earth, he wants to be the king of the earth. And that's exactly what he's trying to do. Using these concordates, as well as many, many other things, we get, we've gotten into the duplicitous things. We've gotten into the deceptive things. We've gotten into how the Jesuits are the assassins for the Pope and how organizations around the world like the FBI, the CIA, and Mossad, the rest of them actually should be called the Pope's secret services because that's who they really work for. The IRS, we call them the Pope's collection agency. Back in three minutes on the investigative journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. 
If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org the following program is labeled dangerous and off limits by the supreme jesuit command but stand tall people listen up and you may just learn something Okay, well, we're back. I guess we could say uh, the concorded class is back in session. <laughs> but anyway, bear with me because, you know, you can do a lot of this research on your own. And I just want to give you a little bit of stimulus here to do that because you're going to find some amazing, amazing things regarding, uh, we're talking right now how these agreements, these treaties uh, can infringe on human rights. And it's amazing. Uh, well, one blanket statement I can, two statements I can make. Your government, I don't, in most, <laughs> I would say in every country in the world, does not, com even in America, where we're supposed to be the bastion of, you know, liberty, they do not care about your human rights. And why would I say that? Because they keep taking them away. It's, you know, they can say what they want, but just look at what they do. And you see a dwindle, uh, a, a basically a wiping away of all the rights that the Constitution on paper afforded. And the reason for that Constitution was so that the Vatican and all their henchmen could get into this country before the Constitution folks 
nobody wanted them here. And this constitution opened the door. So the reason was they're going to come in, as, and when their numbers were few, they acted like lambs. And now that their numbers have become the majority, they act like wolves. That's similar to what goes on in Muslim countries. So there's no really no difference. It's just the way they do it. And in fact, Americans should be more embarrassed because you're getting BS to death. You can't believe anything. They do not want human rights. The Vatican's uh, government of choice is fascism. I'm not just making that up. And if you put together that the Vatican and our government work together, all you got to do is go into the halls of Congress and look at the two big fasci, the Roman fasci, which you know symbolizes fascism, that are prominently displayed in the halls of Congress right behind the podium. That's all you need to see. And then if you look above in the Senate chambers, you're going to see Pope Innocent, I think, of whatever, probably the biggest killer pope ever existed, staring down on supposedly a country that's, you know, free of, uh, you know, is, is separated by church and state. It's not. The Vatican was instrumental in creating this country. And I know now, when I think of the true scale, there's going to be people on the number one, two, and three uh, slots of the true scale on this story are going to say, ah, impossible. The Vatican had nothing to do with the formation of this country. Then people on eight or nine or ten are going to go, you know, Greg might have something... Uh, up his sleeve here when he says that. But anyway, so look at these human rights. We talked about it. It's giving the Vatican rights that other religions don't get in countries. And even for, you know, these concordates can, like I said, anchor other parts of canon law to force people to uh, adhere to canon law in a country and overriding the laws of that country. Now, a concordat can also anchor church doctrine in a country's legal system. And you ask how? For instance, the concordat with Hitler, and that's in Article 9, it still exists, ensures that even crimes cannot be reported if they have come to light through confession. This has been contributing to perpetuating child abuse world, you know, all over the place. Now, we can look at certain violations of religious equality. Any church-state agreement concluded with non-Catholic religious organization of necessity lacked the treaty status of the Vatican Concordates because only the Catholic Church has its own state. What do you think they formed it for? A former Vatican Secretary for Relations with uh, the states, Cardinal Jean-Louis Touran, explains that if concordates didn't have the status of international treaties, they would be subject to local law and therefore always be fragile, insofar as they are dependent upon hazards posed by the political regimes or parliamentary majorities of the future. A group of Polish MPs is among those who have argued that this constitutes a deviation from the principle of equality between religions and equality between citizens, regardless of their faith. And the European Union Network of Independent Experts on Fundamental Rights has concurred. Because a church and state treaty made with a non-Catholic denomination in Slovakia does not gain the status of an international human rights treaty like they do at the Vatican, therefore will not take precedence over the laws of the Slovak Republic. Well, the Vatican's laws take precedence over the Slovak Republic because it's a treaty. Now, divorce was completely eliminated through concordates with several right-wing dictators in the 20th century. And in Malta, even into the 21st century, no divorce was allowed. Right? The Dominican concordate with Trujillo in 1954 which is still in force, says explicitly that people married in a Catholic church and therefore under canon law may never file for divorce. Okay, Boy, the divorce lawyers in this country would go broke. <laughs> oh, they'd fight that tooth and nail. They, don't, they allow it here. Well, hell, have to, have to, you know, what's it, one out of every two marriages ends up in divorce? I don't know if that's correct. So we're looking at 
how they can manipulate. Uh, the, the funny thing is, they don't really care about it. Uh, they just want to manipulate certain things for certain reasons. Uh, unbelievable. But we'll continue on. Uh, the theory, what's this? Most people, when I say Canon law, they think of the Canon camera or something, you know? Like Nikon, Canon, you know, the camera. No, it's Canon law. And it's uh, enforced by the Vatican. Now, it's a Christian counterpart, really, so you can understand it, of Hindu law, of the Jewish law, and of the Muslim Sharia. Uh, Vatican court, it's often let the church apply the Catholic version of this, even when it is running state-subsidized social services to the general public. Now, remember our good friend Eugenio Pacelli, Pope Pius XII, the actual mentor of Hitler, was the main architect of the 1917 Code of Canon Law, and he established its jurisdiction in many of the concordates that he negotiated. As a former Vatican foreign minister uh, notes, quote, the concordates and agreements of the following years had the aim of regulating church life in various countries in accordance with the norms contained in that text. For example, the 1940 Portuguese concordate says that, quote, the Catholic Church in Portugal may organize itself freely in accordance with the norms of canon law, and the 1993 Polish Concordat grants the Church the exercise of its jurisdiction, management, and administration of its own affairs in accordance with canon law. So, let's just make an example here. We're, we hear people crying and screaming, we have these Muslims coming into our country and they go to these places and they form communities and now they call them no-go zone, no zones where the police won't even go in and they've set up Sharia courts and they don't follow our laws. Well, that's exactly what the Vatican's doing, except they're doing it more diplomatically, so to speak. And what they do is they go into a country and say, listen, when we're here, we don't have to abide by your laws and we will abide by canon law. And the country goes, okay. So how do you think they're getting away with pedophilia? Because they'll just say, hey, you don't have any jurisdiction over us here. So you got priests running around molesting children, and then the Vatican now is telling you, oh, we'll take care of it, but yet their concordates say they don't have to because they're not under the state's jurisdiction in many cases because the state has allowed them to exercise their own jurisdiction their own management and administration of its own affairs, which i.e. means cover up the uh, sexual abuse crimes and don't allow the police of that country to investigate. I mean, I there was a case that we dealt with on this show years ago where a Native American child witnessed a, witnessed a priest on one of the Indian reservations bury a child underneath the altar. She tried, she was frightened to do anything, but as she gained, as she got older, she tried, there's no, there's no statute of limitations on murder. She tried to get the authorities to investigate under that church. They wouldn't. And she was told they didn't have the authority to, to go in there. Oh, really? That's here in America. Can you imagine what goes on in countries that, you know, aren't supposedly as uh, democratically open as us? And I put that in quotes. Now, in Italy, for example, well, let's look at uh, the many countries have tried to buck this system, you know, tried to buck the Vatican with, with not much luck. Uh, and speaking of this Polish concordat that allowed the Vatican to do what the hell it wanted, it, you know, Basically, what it did is it limited the Polish state in some matters by ceding the power of the governing bodies to an international organization, which is what the church is. Uh, so, in Italy, for example, the acceptance of a judgment based on canon law was the subject of an appeal before the European Court of Human Rights. Well, that should be a good one. An Italian court had enforced a ruling by the Vatican Court, uh, the Roman Rota, 
which is set up and run according to the norms of canon law. However, in 2001, the European Court rejected this on the grounds that the Vatican Court failed to reach the standards of a fair trial as set forth in the European Convention on Human Rights. So they got caught, huh? Did anything ever happen? No. <laughs> they, get, they got a ruling, and then they kept doing what they want to do. Is basically what happened. So we have all of these transgressions going on, all of these conflicting claims, the Vatican trying to say, listen, we get into your country, we don't have to abide by your laws. You've signed an agreement with us. Uh, and we could probably go on and on and on. There's so many human rights you know, violations uh, in certain cases, courts have, uh, to no avail, have ruled that the uh, concordic clauses have been judged by courts and legal experts to conflict with the requirements of human rights. Now that's come, now, did you hear what I said? Why would you trust this organization? Why would you even consider that they're Christian or you know, God on earth, when they don't even adhere to human rights, they don't want to adhere to human rights. They want to violate them. Now, there's a clause in 2007 concordant with Brazil. Seems calculated to protect the church from being sued for abusive priests. This is in 2007. It hasn't changed. And they're on TV here telling us yesterday they want to do everything possible to stop this. Then why don't they get rid of this concordant? From the point of view of the Vatican, the problem first arose in 2002 in the U.S. when the clerical abuse scandal shocked the nation. 2002 we're talking about here. And we were shocked yesterday again, or this week, with the new revelation of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, and in the first rose, this arose in 2002 in the U.S. when the clerical abuse scandal shocked the nation. And that year on, uh, year one of the victims sued for damages, arguing that the diocese was liable because the priest was essentially its employee. The argument, listen to this, you don't think they're in their, the courts are in their pocket? So here, here's what he was saying. He goes to court and says, the priest, the Vatican, this diocese, okay, whether it be New York or whatever, you are liable for the actions of your priest because he's an employee. Okay, now what does a priest do? He works for the, the church, right? He's in there teaching sometimes. He's giving mass. He's doing counseling. He's an employee. But this argument was rejected by a federal U.S. court in 2012, which let the Vatican off the hook. Do you understand that? Your court, and, I, and when I say the Vatican controls our court system, everybody laughs. Well, how come they didn't agree that the, the diocese was liable for the priest's abusive actions, child abuse, and said, no, they're not liable because he's not an employee. Well, what the hell is he? They're protecting these people. And the courts did it in 2012. Why do you think these priests do it? Because they know they can get away with it. And every now and then some get caught. You know what some, most of these priests, hundreds, thousands of them have been caught. And most of them go, guess who, where they go? Instead of to prison, where they should be, they're sent to a Vatican resting home where they're treated, supposedly, for their sickness. Yeah, they go to a place where they can play golf, read the Bible, or whatever. they don't read the Bible, read whatever they want, their porn books. And then uh, that's their penance. That's their punishment. Or in the case of many of these priests, because courts like the federal U.S. court in 2012 let them off, they're sent to another diocese. So they're pedophiles in New York. Okay, they're on to us here in New York. Let's send them to Alaska. They don't know us there. And then they just transfer these guys all over the place. So. They abuse kids in New York, then when they get caught, they send them to, the, to, to uh, another state. Now, 
What do you think? I, I, was ta- I was wondering, I said yesterday, oh, this Pennsylvania thing was 20 years old. I heard it was more than that. Somebody told me today 50 to 70 years this was going on, and nothing has been done about it. Don't you think the police and the courts are in their pocket? Yeah. Uh, now, let's look at uh, the bright side here. In Britain, however, remember that federal U.S. court in 2012 said, no, the Vatican will let them off the hook on this one. However, in 2011, the same argument was upheld by a high court in Britain, which held that the Catholic diocese could be held responsible for an abusive priest. The next year, in a similar case, the British Supreme Court ruled that the Catholic religious order could be liable for a child abuse committed by the monks who taught in its schools. Uh, So... I don't think I've named I can think of a country where this doesn't go on. The secret negotiations for the Brazilian Concordat began in 2006, the year after the abusive scandal broke in that country, and it was revealed that many priests had been targeting poor and fatherless children. The Vatican diplomats will have, uh, will have been well aware of the financial danger to the Brazilian Church of the Claim, for this claim, already making its way through the American courts that priests were church employees and their diocese could therefore be sued. So now they're they're thinking about what's going through the American courts, although they were ruled in their favor. So guess what they did? They, They made sure that the Brazilian concordat stated that should should there be any problems with sexual abuse, the the diocese cannot be sued for the actions of a priest. All right, that's recent. How can they get on TV and people believe when they got all these things signed into law in other countries that they're actually going to do that? Oh, we're going to correct the problem, they said yesterday, right? We're going to correct everything. We're, We're so wrong. We let this slip through the cracks. They didn't let it. They're they're writing documents here stating they want their priests to get away with sexual abuse. That's why. You can't believe a word they say on TV or on the news about any of this stuff. Okay, there's a lot more I can talk about, and I'll do another show on this. Uh, i got about five minutes. And there's many things. I I love to talk about how they sneak these, uh, and with the help of lawyers and politicians, how they sneak these concordats through in different countries. And that'll take a show, so I'll wait on that. But how do you stop this? I mean, people are, you know, anybody that listens to the show is going to go, how can we stop these concordats? Can we stop this? I mean, this is a worldwide problem. But really, only public awareness will make it politically possible to, to maybe get rid of them. I mean, I don't know any other way you can do it. That's why these shows are important. And that's why I ask you, go to my website at greganthonysjournal.wordpress.com or at the end of them, you'll see my videos out there. You'll see where you can go to Patreon. Is that how you pronounce that, that website? I'm on there where you can uh, become a, a, a member and donate some money to keep the show going. That's why these shows are important because you're not going to hear this many places. And I... I'm just the tip of the iceberg on this, and this that's what this show really is about, to get you to look at this deeper and to really understand that this is not just an American problem. This is a worldwide problem, and really, why, why shouldn't we think otherwise? Because what do they really want to inform? Their new world order, right? Which is actually an old world order. But anyway, for practical purposes, we'll call it a new world order. But only public awareness will do this, and... Most politicians will remain afraid of displeasing the Vatican than of protecting the rights of their own electorate. That is the fact. They don't want to displease them. Your, your TV commentators don't want to displease them. Your politicians are in their pocket because that's where the money is, the control. And when you talk about America going, now you've got this whole big half the country wants to make America great again. Half the country wants open borders and a globalization of America. Who do you think's going to win? The globalization of America because the Vatican wants that. 
That's what they're shooting for. And the best way to get it is to put both sides at odds, like they're doing now, rub them together and get their own synthesis. It's called the Gagalian dialectic. And they play it to a T. Now, has anybody in America demonstrated against Vatican authority here? Are you kidding me? But in 2016, about 400 people demonstrated against their country's concordats in where? Catholic Croatia. Okay? <laughs> we can get into a history of concordats that have been canceled back going. They've been doing this since, I don't know, 1500s. This is nothing new to them. Why do you think, and, uh, you know, I'll get more into stopping these in another show because I am running out of time. Why do you think that the leaders of the world bow down to these people in Rome? Not purely because of the occult and satanic uh, worshiping and all this occult stuff you hear about, which is, man, just incredibly sick. But it's also money and power and this kind of elite idea of a better world that they're only going to have if they get rid of 90% of us. That's their goal. They don't want people around to cause them problems. And the more that the world gets automatized and computerized and robots and all this kind of stuff, and you think I'm crazy, they don't need people anymore. They really don't. The only reason most people have been allowed to live over the years is because they needed them to work for them. Slaves. And what is America? Oh, you say, we're not slaves here. Oh, yeah? I'll give you a little clue. Ever since the 14th Amendment was passed, and remember we hear, oh, we got rid of slave, black slavery. No, no. When black slavery was solely eliminated, they passed the 14th Amendment, which enslaved everybody, black and white. Do a little homework on that. So really, you're just a slave to the system here. And uh, we're trying to figure out how to, how to change that, right? Back tomorrow on The Investigative Journal. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188.